Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought-provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. On today's episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored and pleased to have for our 600th episode, our 600th guest of the Cross Border Interviews from Cypress County, Alberta, Councillor Robin, and I literally forgot your last name, Kirby White. Kirby White. Yeah. Counsel- the, well, how could you possibly forget <laughs> Kirk <Kirby White>, Yeah, <laughs> Counselor, thank you so much for doing this. I want to start with the basic question that I start all my interviews off. And for the 600th episode, you're no exception. Mm. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? You know, it. I, some people call it calling. Some people call it haunting. Sometimes I feel haunted by by the call to be, to be involved in my community. It's uh, It's... Something that uh, from an early age I got involved in in local politics and and service and helping people in the community, and uh, every time that an election came up, uh, we were asked to consider you know getting involved, whether that be at a provincial or federal level or or municipal, and it was always the wrong time, the wrong time, the wrong time, and in 2017, uh, it just felt like the right time, and uh, that's uh, that's really what it came down to. I've always wanted to help out in the community, and this was one way that we could start with that. So I want to go back to the beginning, though, sure. because you don't just randomly wake up one day and say, I'm going to run for council. No, that's true. Were your parents political? No. Nope. Not at all? Not at all. No, but... Uh, like, I, was it discussed at the dinner table, not, even? Not at all. No, I was uh, going back. I was probably 16 years old when I was uh, on my first constituency board for Lauren Taylor, who was at the time Minister of, Envi- Minister of Environment, I believe, at the, at the time. For the province. And, uh, for the province. And... Uh, I was a part of a group of young young conservatives that uh, we were known as King Klein's kids. So we would uh, we'd get rallied in to come in and do some security detail, make sure that nobody was gonna throw something at uh, at the premier at the time. And and that was honestly that was what got me started is just getting involved at the at the most basic level and helping out uh, on the board and learning a little bit about governance and how that goes. And uh, and then from there you just you, you stay involved and you make friends and. Uh, you you kind of look at it and you start dreaming a little bit about what it might be like to actually be behind the table. And so I actually started off mostly as a lobbyist. Um, when I was 19, I worked at the United Nations um, as a lobbyist for three weeks right before the World Trade Centers went down. Actually, I was there for the World Summit for Children and Families. It was the fourth preparatory conference for that. Uh, the group I was working with was the World Youth Alliance, and we were a, a body of five million youth around the world that were focused on promoting the dignity and respect for the human person. That was that was what got me in. And so, you know, you spend hours upon hours upon hours uh, at the General Assembly working with people and trying to 
make small wins on language and policy. Um, when you get to a point where you know I graduated from that into you know running that that drug prevention program I told you a little bit about, and then to working with the Chamber of Commerce and with the construction associations where you represent your memberships with the the municipal and the provincial and federal governments to make sure that we have policies in place that are appropriate for the communities and for the workforce and for the industries and and uh, you know what a what a difference it makes to be. Uh, the one behind the table um, versus the one that's presenting to the table, and and uh, so it was it was definitely a, an aspiration that you know built, I'd say 15 years ago, and then it was kind of a slow build into that. You know, getting connected in the right boards and and uh, you know becoming a little bit more known. I was always my my father and my grandfather were very well known in the area. My grand great grandparents homesteaded here in the early 1900s. And, uh, but I was, as Robin Kirpywood, I was always Robin, son of Sheldon, son of Reuben, you know, and, and uh, I knew Feels like an old Scottish Celtic. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and so when, uh, when it was started to be, oh, you're Sheldon, you must, you're Robin's dad, then we knew that it was maybe the, the, the right time to get, uh, to get going. <laughs> You talk about provincially, mm -hmm. you talk about international politics that you were involved in with yeah. the UN, you talked about uh, your constituency. How does a guy who were, has connections to the UN, who has connections to the Progressive Conservative Party under Ralph Klein, wind up being a counselor for his home community? Because it sounds like my the trajectory that you were on was to go either provincially or federally. Mm -hmm. What made you decide in 2017 that municipally is where you want to start or even just give back in the political realm? I think timing was a big part of it. You know, we had three young kids at the time. Um, my wife and I started fostering around the same time. And uh, it was... You know, I also own my own business, right? So once you jump into provincial or federal, um, you know, you're, you're kind of walking away from that for the most part. And so I think that being municipal, it was a really good option to, uh, to get involved. And I looked at it as an opportunity to build a resume too, because if as an elected official municipally, if you do well, it makes transitioning to another level a lot easier. If you do poorly, um, then you probably shouldn't get hired at the next level. And, and uh, so, you know, that was great. But you're right. Like my, my brain is wired for uh, kind of that 30 and 40,000 foot policy stuff that provincial and federal definitely allows you to sink your teeth into, which is, I think, why um, the, my interest within RMA and with FCM uh, was able to kind of blossom because you can't get involved in those organizations and do that kind of provincial and federal lobbying work as a municipal councillor unless you're an elected official. And so it was a good fit that way. In 2017, you decided to put your name forward. I'm assuming there's not just a light switch that goes off and say, hey, this is the election. This is the one mm. that I'm going to choose because there's previous elections. I know timing is a big thing, but you, you ultimately have to make a decision to say, okay, this is the election. This is the one that yeah. I'm choosing. What was going on in Cypress County that you said to yourself, okay, everything at home is good. Kids are growing up. We've got a stable foundation here, potentially, with the wife and uh, kids and a little bit older than they were four years ago. Now let's look at what's going on in the county. What was going on in the county for you to say, okay, this is the election? Or was there an issue? No. Or, because a lot of times when I talk to councillors and mayors <clears throat> and Reeves, they will say that there wasn't just one issue that made them go into it. It yeah. was a desire to give back, and that was the realm that they wanted to start at. Was that like it for you, or was there an issue that sort of put you to say, Robin's opinion around that council table would be a benefit, not just to my area, but to the entire county? Yeah, I, and I, I think that... I can understand where others would say, you know, the time to give back. Yeah, but, you know, I was in my mid-30s. I don't think that that would qualify as, as my, my primary reason. When it, it boiled down to it, I saw that Cypress County is a beautiful place to live. It's a gem in the <laughs> southeast. Um, there has always been this um, sentiment that I've never bought into, but I understand why it's there about how we're the forgotten corner or the unknown corner in, in southeastern Alberta. I think there's a podcast called The Forgotten Corner. Yeah, <laughs> probably, but it was always something that I I really took issue with because I think that uh, until you step up and speak up, you're going to be unheard and unseen. 
And uh, what I'm very good at, and and uh, and what we've done very well, I think, since we've uh, gotten onto council, is is the networking side and promoting uh, an area and and have having that voice and. Um, you know, whether it's at RMA now or at FCM on the federal level, um, Cypress County's voice has definitely been elevated to, to different heights. And that, that I think is a, a big part of, you know, what I'm able to help bring to the table. It's, you know, everybody has their gifts. Mine is, I have a lot of energy. I love to bring people together. I enjoy making new friends. I am very passionate about making friends with people who I have strong disagreements with. Uh, I think that that is something that our world is missing right now. We've become so polarized on both sides that even though, you know, down the road, provincial or federal, you know, still is something that intrigues me, um, we need to find a way to, to bridge this gap right now. I, I make the joke all the time that my business is building walls, but in politics, I build bridges. And uh, that is that is something that we need to do a lot more of. You, you bring up a good point, and I love these conversations where I, I feed off of what people say. At the round the council table, you have to look at issues not as a conservative or an NDP or a liberal or a green or a block or a people's party or whatever. Mm -hmm. You have to look at it as a resident. Yeah. And you have to work with people who may have different political leanings than you. Yeah. In your six years as a councillor... Have you been able to find that sweet spot of being able to work with people, but understand that at the end of the day, you may not go for a beer with them? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that it, it depends on who you're working with. <laughs> um, I, I look I look back to, you know, when I first got into my career in communications. Um, you know, we sat down and we did Myers Briggs, we did the True Colors personality oh, tests. God. Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is that when you compare 2001, 2002, and that approach to which what we're doing in, in doing that exercise is how do we self-assess and learn about how we operate and how we receive information and communicate. But we also are learning about how does Chris Brown receive information and communicate and how can I connect with you? And what we've lost in the last 15, 20 years is this desire, I believe, to want to know how the person that we're working with engages. Because whether it be true colors, you know, yellow, green, blue, um, gold, I think it was, or, or um, orange yeah um or it being political colors knowing what your friend or your colleague feels just allows you to know what filter they're viewing life through and if you are an em empathetic person and you can sit and understand you don't have to buy into what they think or believe on those specific issues but it al allows you to at least to um start in a position of good faith where you're trying, first of all, to understand uh, what motivates the person that you're talking to. I think right now the challenge that we have is that there is a, a, a large amount of people out there that are not interested in reciprocating that kind of an approach. And uh, so, yeah, I, I've worked with people across the board that have very different ideas, but somebody that might have a lot of the same ideas as me also doesn't necessarily want to do the work to understand the other side. That makes things a little bit tougher. You represent a ward in uh, Cypress County, and you sit around the council table with different people who represent different wards. But you know and I know that you can't look at the individual wards when you're mm -hmm. making decisions. You have to look at the big picture. Yeah. In your role as councillor and advocating not only for the greater population, but for the individual, how do you do that? Because, and I'm going to quote Spock mm -hmm. off of Star Trek here. Oh, awesome. <laughs> the exact thing? Yeah. God, a lot of municipal councillors are getting this joke, and I love it. How do you balance the needs of the many against the needs of the few? Hmm. You know, again, you have to take that step back and and remember that when you're, when you're making it Is it easy to take that step back, though? No, not at all. In fact, I think that they should abolish ward systems. Yes, I said it. All right. Okay. You, well, you, you said you, episode you, 600. You, you, you and gotta Kevin be Sahara <laughs> should sit down and chat because he wants to abolish some communities. You want to abolish the ward well, system. Th here's, here's the problem, though, that, that exists with the ward systems. Is that as much as you want to make something happen for the community as a whole, yeah. at the end of the day, the funding rarely exists to, to do a project that is so broad-reaching that you can actually implement it across the entire county. I'm going to use water as an example in Cypress County. We, whether it be potable or raw water, we know that we need some access to more raw water so that people have the ability to, to grow, develop. Water is life. We know that. Um, 
But the stumbling point always comes down to, well, where do you start it? You know, you have one person that brings it forward. Another counselor might look at it as a threat to the fact that they may not be prioritized into getting it done. And then it comes down to this. That's where the ugliness in politics municipally comes from, is now you're trying to fight and, and find ways that you can, you know, prioritize your, your, your district or your ward one over the other. And I think that that is a challenge. And, and yeah, there's, there's, there's a few other reasons I think that we need to look at. That I'm going to play devil's advocate with you. Though, Please, though. go for it. Because... That would be all great, that mm. everyone would work together, but wouldn't you have communities in your organization, even let's take Cypress County, wouldn't the, if every councillor was elected just in around Dunmore area yeah. where the city office I, is. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from with that, and you're not, you're not wrong. The, the term abolish was probably a little <laughs> bit on the strong point, but you know, it's, we, hey. we need to get the views. So... <laughs> But <laughs> most of ours are listeners, man. So. All right. But the uh, when I when I look at it though, it is we have we have wards right now that have twelve hundred people in them, and then another ward that has two hundred people in them. And so you know, at representation, it, it wards provide and they 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 do create some challenges currently. So how do you look at it though? Because you talk about abolishing and potentially moving to a more at large area. But right now we have that scenario where yeah. you are elected to represent the people that you've put you in that position. We go back to communication here for a second because communication, I think, is key for a lot of municipal councillors, even though that some might not do it as good as others. Mm -hmm. It's key. Yeah. How do you engage with your residents knowing that sometimes you're going to have to upset them and say, sorry, guys, this is not in the works for our ward this time because... Ward 2 or Ward 4 or Ward mm -hmm. 9 or Ward 8 is a lot more worse off than we are, and we have to just balance out the needs of theirs with the needs of what we want. So my personal style yes. is overwhelm them with information. <laughs> like, it, there's in, in this day and age, people want access to details and information, and I find that if you can answer and, and provide the answers to the becauses and the here's whys and, and give... People are intelligent. If you give them the reasoning why, you're not going to convince everybody, but if there are good reasons why different priorities happen, that that's fine. But just to take the approach of trust us, we've got this under control, that doesn't work anymore. And uh, so I, I definitely try to err on the side of um, over-informing as much as possible. Is there a balance that you have to take when over-informing and correcting misinformation mm -hmm. and lies? Yeah. Because well, you can over-inform someone as much as you want, but they mm -hmm. can go away and say, well, that's a complete pot yeah. of crock that you just sold me, and I know the truth. So how do you balance what's out there with what the what you understand is to be true? Well, tactics and the narrative and who, who gets the information out there first is important. right? We talked about this a little bit earlier, too, on how... Um, when you have things that come up that are a little bit more contentious, uh, make sure that you get the facts and the details out there up front and center. Uh, I've always believed that communications people within municipal organizations would value greatly in having a white paper that is published whenever there is a, a, a major uh, issue that is, is being discussed and decided that basically is an overall summary and frequent, you know, FAQ of here is, here is what we're doing, here is the, the methodology, the reason behind, you know, the conversation, here's the decision that we made based on the following criteria. And as questions come in, and no different than, you know, I, I work in the construction industry and if we have a, a big tender that comes up if there are questions that are asked by one contractor the question is published the answer is published to everybody and uh and that way there everybody benefits from the same questions and answers that are being promoted again devil's advocate yeah. because as someone who's worked in the communications field for a municipality you can communicate to the your blue in the face mm -hmm. unless you go to every single door Mm -hmm. every single person and literally put it in front of them mm -hmm. there's going to be those people who say i didn't get it i yeah. didn't understand it because you can do social media you can do uh, yeah. telephone town halls you yeah. can put it on the website you can even do posters and bulletin boards there's going to be people who just say i didn't get it so yeah. how do you balance especially in rural communities because we are in a rural community right now yeah how do you balance communicating with understanding that sometimes it's up to the residents if they want to be informed or not Ag agreed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know, I, and I hear what you're saying, but I think that that you know, I've also seen in different situations where if you people wanted to hear the the information, that that's that's an important step. But 
there's also a willingness for an organization to get that information out ahead of time. And I think that's a bit of a culture change too. Because, uh, you know, when you look back 20, 30, 40 years in a lot of municipalities and organizations, it has been more of a, we are running the county, leave it to us. Um, and now people don't necessarily trust the institutions as much. And so it's important to be out front and to get that information out there ahead of time so that when people do start responding and saying, hey, like, where was this or whatever, you can actually point to it and say, look, it published on this date. Here's all the stuff, not coming up with it after the fact, yeah. because again, you come up with the information after the fact and people will never trust it. If you come up with the information ahead of time, you just say, hey, listen, this is this is our our methodology is that we you know publish this ahead of time you see everything that's there if you have any questions certainly come to us but um i think that we're in a in a, in a bit of a shift in mindset right now with, with from a ratepayer's perspective where the distrust in institution and government at times um is leading to a desire to become more engaged whether that means fully or just from an activist side uh, you know is yet to be seen are people apathetic in cypress county in some cases, yeah, and then some things wake you up and pull you out of apathy, right? And and I don't know, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. A apathy, it sometimes can be a sign of, um, you know, contentment, um, and that you know they're apathetic until they're not, and something sets them off, and then you know if it's big enough, uh, it it may not go you know back into dormancy again. It might just stay, you know, engaged and hot and and and. Well, hard, you know, hard wire. The reason I ask that question is because I, I've sat down with many councillors and mayors across this country, and what they hear from their residents don't traditionally, the issues that they hear about, don't traditionally fall in the municipal jurisdiction. They will talk about provincial health care education. They'll talk about mm -hmm. things that are going on federally because, quote yeah. unquote, that's the sexy stuff. Yeah. And municipally, they don't want to talk about wastewater treatment or yeah. water potable or not. Yeah. When you get people talking to you from your ward, from your county, is it more municipal issues that people are talking about? Or do you find that you're fielding more provincial and federal questions? So the phone calls that I get are municipal. Okay. Um, yeah, the phone calls that I am getting mostly right now, uh, you know, we're in another very dry year. Uh, I get a lot of phone calls about cutting ditches, um, you know, guys that are trying to hay ditches and, and bale it up and why are we mowing the grass and not farming it and baling it and, you know, uh, water is, is one that, you know, forever is, is going to be a, a bigger and bigger issue. I don't have to deal with a lot of wastewater in my area because most of our, you know, we're all septic fields and, and uh, we don't have a lot of sewer systems even throughout the county. Most of it is septic. Um, but do you get the random provincial or federal question? Not so much. No, not, I am shocked at this right yeah, now. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe it's the fact that I, I tend to differentiate. Like if, if I get a call on it, it's like, well, you know, contact the MP or the MLA cause that's not our jurisdiction. But, but you can't do that for every single person, though, right? But because honestly, the the I probably in my ward, I, I don't get a lot of provincial and federal stuff. Um, I, I you know I have had calls when the uh, the the gun control debate was going on. I had people that would call me up, but I also had a little bit of an avenue to exercise on that because I was working with FCM, chairing the rural caucus, and we were able to have those debates and discussions at the federal level. So, but truly, Chris, uh, the the majority of what I get is more along roads grading uh washboard on roads dust abatement so it's it's that they've definitely you know stayed within within the lines on that one i want to ask one last question then i want to turn to cypress county as a whole sure and i want to know about the personal public life of a politician especially in a rural community like cypress county mm -hmm. you go out to the grocery store you go to a community event you're a counselor yeah you don't take your hat off while people may assume that politicians get paid big bucks we know, you and I know, that you don't. You are yeah. basically a volunteer job, and the only time that you get paid are when you're in meetings, yeah. and for the majority of it. Yeah. Have you found the work-life balance achievable, especially with a large family, mm -hmm. uh, being in a rural community where you're able to disconnect from being counselor and being just Robin? Yeah, I, I think that I have. the. Um... Would your family say that? Yeah. They would ultimately. I think that the voter is the one that decides on it, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I, I, for me, 
I've been, we said I got nine kids. It's a lot of it's a lot of, of attention that is is needed at home, and that's not counting my wife. And she she needs even more attention than the nine, um, just to make sure that she's okay after the day with all those kiddos. <laughs> but the um, you know I, I try to attend the events that I can. Um, I do I, I talk with a lot of people over the phone. We have a lot of conversations. We run into each other whether it be at schools or or special events. But um, you know it's it's a little bit different than. You know, being in the city where you have chamber of commerce events and all these different things, where you know you have the the city council being invited to, and you're always kind of within that same thing. We have a couple of community halls in my ward, and uh, you know we we have a couple of projects that we work on together. We've got the the windmill projects that are going on out here. I have a fair amount of engagement on those, and uh, you know the equestrian centers garnered a lot of, of attention and calls and strategy and meetings over the last four or five years. And, uh, you know, so you stay engaged as, as you can on those and then the boards that you're on. And, uh, but I, I do, I feel like, um, I give what I'm able to. And from what I hear from those who, who I talk to, uh, I have, I have the support of the community that, that elected me. And I think that at the end of the day, that, that is the, the most important part because that's who I'm accountable to. I want to drink to Cypress County as a whole now. Before I ask this question, I want to preface it because I do this a lot on the show. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. We always get emails about this question. Thank you for clarifying <laughs> that ahead of time. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, Robin, mm -hmm. in your opinion, as councillor, not as a direction of council, what is the biggest issue facing the county today? Um... Or issues, issues as in problems or opportunities. Because I whatever way you want to answer let's, that question, let's focus on the opportunities. I love it. I, I think that the biggest issue and opportunity that can be focused on for Cypress County right now is water and food security. You know, we are in one of the hottest, driest corners of the province. Um, you know, in, in my time with FCM, we worked heavily on creating new fiscal frameworks and funding models for municipalities when it comes down to climate adaptation and mitigation and trying to tie in some of the resiliency and opportunity type of projects that would come from, um, you know, adapting and mitigating flooding, for example, is having more and more reservoirs. And with reservoirs, you have a, an increased ability to provide water for irrigation and for some of those raw water projects like we talked about. These kind of things are not cheap. They're also things that are not generally funded as a municipal only. And, uh, and so they're oftentimes shared uh, between the three levels of government. And we, we need to continue to push on the 15 and 20 year strategies. And I think that that is the biggest opportunity. It's also the biggest challenge because we tend to focus on the here and now. And I think that anytime that a municipal government is looking at specifically councils that are looking at things that are about today, we're maybe losing sight of why we're there. We're trying to project and lay out a plan and from a governance perspective that is going to lead the community and the county into the next 25 years. Um, we must be able to answer questions like, what does the county look like in 10 years, in 20 years? We have to have those visions and then we have to work to make that happen. It well, doesn't happen on its own. Well, it's important to think about 10 years from now. You can't forget about the here and now. Nope. Because there's issues that are going on in this community, yeah. I'm assuming. Because there's there's I, a certain level of reacting, for sure. Exactly. So how do you balance that? And how does this council balance the needs of forethought mm -hmm. with the needs of not reacting? Because I hate reacting to issues, but being proactive on the issues that are going on in the community today. Yeah, well, you hit, you hit the word on the head, like proactive <laughs> versus reactive, right? Like there's a difference between making sure that you have enough greater operators and graders that versus going and actually taking the keys from the greater operator's hands and finishing the road. That that is not our role. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's not. Sh we, shocking, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, to me, you you have to have a certain level and and a, and a healthy level of trust uh, and and accountability within your administration to deliver on those day to day things. When you have a council having to get involved in a react reaction stuff at a operating level. I, I don't think that's the role. Now, there are still things that come up like emergencies and things like that where you have water to, main breaks you never anticipate, but they happen. Yeah, but a, a water main breaking. What is that for council? Council has to approve a budget. 
right? It's mm-hmm. a budget item, but that's that's still maintenance. It's a budget item, but then if that budget then pushes you over into the red, which you know municipalities can't run deficits, right. you then have to look at where do we cut back? Okay. So, and then what are your reserves? And are yeah. you are you running so lean that you don't have reserves for things like that? And we'll if that is the case, right? <laughs> like we, so in, in Cypress County, we have, we have a lot of money in the bank, not as much as say, um, you know, uh, Wood Buffalo, and you know they got they've got a pretty good chunk of change. But even when they had the fires and the floods, like they had the ability to tap into some of these different reserves. We aren't there to make profits, but we are also there to govern appropriately. When you have to replace equipment and you have to replace different pipelines and everything, you need. That's why asset management is so important. Knowing and projecting what's going to be there, because if you're having to fix something on your road grading allowance because you didn't project that stuff happens. That comes back to why is council not thinking about the things that can happen and why are we, you know, we live in an area where we have some of the lowest taxes. Cypress County has, you know, our, our taxes on a percentile base um, are, are among the lowest in the entire province. And uh, one of the things I, I, I like low taxes, I, I enjoy low taxes, but in my first and second year, I, I started promoting um, a, a a bit of a shift in thinking when it came to tax management and then financial projecting in order to manage stuff like that because we were we were kind of in a race to the bottom we had money set aside that we we're like oh we're, we're good we're safe but we weren't able to offer some of the services that we wanted to or that our rate payers wanted to because we would play the card that you know we we didn't we don't have the money for it but we were in the lowest tax bracket and then it also meant that we were only able to achieve and maintain status quo too And so we looked at it and said, okay, instead of being at the first percentile on oil and gas, which still generates like 65% of the revenue in the county, why don't we try to get all of our land uses at the 20th percentile? That way there, when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm a farmer, why am I paying so much for my taxes? We can look at them and say, here is why we set the mill rate where we do. The assessment, you know, whether it's provincially assessed or it's done municipally, that, that, that is what it is. Council set the mill rate and what we look at is we just say, okay, in three years, four years ago, we looked at it and said, in order to be where we want to be in five years, if we aim to be at the 20th percentile on all four land uses, it's fair and equitable across the table. There's a rhyme and reason to why we're doing it, not just laying it on one rate payer all yeah. the time. And, uh, and we're actually going to have revenue that we can start putting into our asset management program make sure that we're banking on things does the county not have an asset management program right now well we have it we have, we're, okay. we're working through it and we're tracking our tangible and non-tangibles and and making sure that like, we've always had it for our trucks and like fleet equipment and things but we're working on it now for our things like bridges and culverts because as the province begins to download a little bit more and more <laughs> and you aren't sure what you're going to be doing it's funny how you know a 50 million dollar liability looks more like a 150 million dollar liability or 200 and we know that if oil and gas is on its way down that is a risk that we that we you know have to acknowledge when it's one of our biggest customers um, how do we ensure that uh, we are prepared and you know make the proper decisions ahead of time so that when that potentially disappears someday that we don't just risk having to amalgamate and dissolve because we can't afford to to stay in business ourselves is it hard to say no to people? No, I don't think so. Especially when people come to you and ask for help. Because at the end of the day, the decisions you make, and I'm going to, I, mm-hmm. I quote Scott Pierce on this show more often than I ever thought I would after he became president, but here we are. Mm-hmm. He's right when he said that you are the government of proximity. Yep. The decisions you make are going to affect people the day after you make them. Yeah, that's right. You're not in Edmonton, you're not in Ottawa. Yeah. When people come to you and say, we can't survive on raising taxes to potentially look at 10, 15 years from now, or even uh, raising service levels to offset some of the things that you might have to renegotiate and move yeah. around, is it hard to look at people and say, I-, I would love to help you, but unless we, like you say, fold, yeah, this is how it has to be done? Mm. See, and that to me... I, I don't like disappointing people. Yeah. I don't. It have, doesn't seem like you do, though. No, I. But I. I don't. I don't mind saying no. Okay. Um, and and saying no again 
my style is no, but here are the reasons why. And if we can, if there are enough, like that's the thing with democracy is if you have enough people that are prepared to do something a little bit differently, like if just let's use a, a, a random example, there was a desire at one point to maybe build a, a hockey arena in Dunmore, uh, connect it with the high school and do a big hockey academy. If, if there was a countywide desire to make that thing go, you could, you could make some changes within the taxes, you could fund it, you could do your thing and, and you could go. But if you have five or six councillors that absolutely do not want to do it, um, at the end of the day, what council decides is what people are, are stuck with, or at least that's what the, the decision that is made. Um, but to me, it, it, I'm not afraid of no. I'm, I'm not afraid of no as long as the answers are there. If I'm not comfortable with the answers, no can suck because then I have the same kind of frustration and perhaps unrest as the ratepayers do. And that's where then you have that struggle of making sure that you are, as a counselor, um, not getting too into the weeds because then your desire is to get involved at the administration level, not at the governance level. You, I want to ask this question correctly, so I apologize if I, I stop and start twice here. But you are in a rural community. Mm -hmm. Your taxes may be low, mm -hmm. but the cost of living out here is high. Yep. When you increase taxes even 1% on people, particularly in this ch tough economic time, it is challenging for people. When you walk into that council table and make the decisions, you have to make some pretty tough choices. Does it weigh on you? Yeah. If it doesn't, you shouldn't do it. Understandable, but how do you get through that? Because the decisions you make are affecting people's pocketbooks. Yeah. And we we know we we we, we see Twitter, we yeah. see Facebook, the people who complain and are upset about the provincial and federal governments. But yeah. traditionally, municipalities have a bigger impact on our day to day lives because that's where our property taxes are going, and yeah. then it's being dispersed by provincial levy the school levy yeah i think value how do you get through those days when you know that the decisions you're about to make are about to impact your neighbors your family members and your community members i think that value-based decision making is important because i can't think right now of many times where we've had to make a decision that was going to massively negatively influence somebody but not even negatively impact someone well, like even an impact of one percent could be a hundred dollars could be two hundred dollars and some people are just scraping by right now so a hundred dollars so right now on just i'm going to use an example with uh with the ag rates in cypress county yeah a one percent increase is two dollars oh, okay a year a not year. a month a year. okay all right. Okay. So in like some quarters of land are $120 for the year for a quarter. Okay. Right. So there are certain, you know, parts where, you know, ag contributes 1.8 million a year to our $30 million budget. Right. Uh, oil and gas contributes like 20 million a year. And, uh, so 1% on oil and gas is significant, but I've had some interesting conversations with oil and gas as well, because yes, they have enjoyed some of the lowest mill rates in the province down here. But going back 15, 20, 30 years ago, oil and gas companies were in extremely philanthropic too. Um, when gas dropped in 2009, uh, a lot of that community giving slowed down or even stopped. And uh, when you have philanthropic kind of approaches from a, a corporate level, you can keep taxes low because the community takes care of itself. When that disappears, the only way that you can provide community services is to fund it through the county, which yeah. our only tax generating is through tax. You know, 1% on our oil and gas is like three quarters of a million bucks in a year, right? But 1% on ag, for example, is 18,000. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. And I apologize for asking that No, question. I don't mind I, at all. I think, I think it's great. an important question that people need to realize yeah. that... I'm not saying that because your your statement about you know when things are tight, a hundred bucks is a lot for some people. Even I, two bucks is a lot right? for a lot of people. Yeah, right? and so, like, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that people yeah, are struggling. It's yeah, just I don't want to I don't want <laughs> to diminish that at all. But I think that 
when I look at it and go, all right, when, if we make a decision and that decision means that it's going to end up costing somebody something more, are we able to provide enough of a value you know, with that? You can't just maintain the status quo while increasing costs. If you're increasing costs, you better be prepared to deliver more, to be more engaged, to be you know, providing better services. Um, otherwise, how do you sell it? I want you to put your former chair of the Rural Caucus at FCM hat yep. on right now. Okay. And this is not a question about Cypress County in general. This is about rural communities sure. across Canada. You have been on the front lines of rural municipalities for six years now. You have seen and heard from stories from municipal councillors from across Canada. Are rural councils struggling right now? And do they have a future in Canada because you said a key word a little bit a while ago about amalgamation, mm -hmm. about the future. If it doesn't look good, you're going to have to fold up and amalgamate with communities around you. Can you see that happening in some parts of this country? Yeah, I can. Um, I know you just you, yeah, you struggled I, I to gulped, answer that. I, gulped, I apologize. I gulped there, and and but so I just like you said earlier, like this is this is my. This is your opinion. I'm not even. I'm not even wearing the former hat as the rural guy for FCM because this is something that just as because I feel you're like, seeing downloading from the provincial government yeah. and territorial governments. You're seeing municipalities get a big bill from mm -hmm. the federal government with retroactive pay. I'm not sure if Cypress yeah. County got one, but I'm assuming they did. Because yeah, that Alberta's managed more through the province and, and things like. But where you see it is like Saskatchewan and Manitoba and yeah. and in Ontario, Quebec. There's. There's differences that way, but they, you got to remember, there are some rural municipalities that have like 45 people in them. <laughs> like, holy smokes. How many, you were at, at uh, SARM, yeah. um, how, how many members do they have? I think they have something like I 600 was at Suma rural. And they have 700. If I, uh, John Mark is going to probably yell at me once I say this number, yeah. but I think it's over 700. Yeah. Uh, and that's a lot. <laughs> like, I love my Saskatchewan brothers and sisters. You know all that. Um, but, like, Holy smokes! There are a lot of municipalities throughout Saskatchewan, and well, New and, Brunswick as well, and even Manitoba. And they all went yeah. through that amal forced amalgamation from the province. Yeah, and and so like you, at a certain point, I do agree that that there needs to be the conversation about what is the most effect effective, efficient. At the, at the end of the day, we have one we have one taxpayer. Yeah, we are more and more being identified as that third order of government. It's Even like, though they don't treat you like it. Well, yeah, you know, and maybe it might, it must be getting near a federal election because now we're hearing all three parties referring to it as a, you know a municipal as another order of government, which is like, can you put that in writing, please? But the uh, at, at the end of the day, how can we have the strongest voice? Yeah, and what having the strongest voice doesn't necessarily mean having more voices. It, it is how do you organize, and I think that that's why. Do you think rural it, voices get heard at the table? Yeah, yeah. It's, because we always think about Edmonton, Toronto, yeah. Calgary. No, I think, and this is this is a personal one for me because this has been my mission for the last three, four years with with FCM, is that rural has unique challenges that we face. And when I got in as rural chair and working with FCM, and I was the rural rep for Alberta on the board. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the first thing was, well, how do we define rural? How do we ref define it? And uh, what we ended up coming to, to grips with is that you can't, because it's so vast, so so broad, so general. Like there, there you got rural Alberta is very different than northern Alberta. You got you know rural and interior of BC, and then you've got Yukon and Kalawit and like rural it covers a lot. And but what we have to do is we have to recognize the differences that we have. We need to be confident in the voice that we have as rural and we have to be unashamedly bold but we also have to be problem solvers we can't just come and say woe is us we're not seen we're not heard mm -hmm. if you go in like I, I one of my favorite conversations that we had with uh, some of the different federal leaders um, with uh, Jagmeet Singh uh, back in I think it was December and I could just I told him like we we have challenges that are so unique. We we need to be able to um, find ways as rural as the rural municipalities and as the the rural form. We can't approach it the same way as the cities do, where it's all about funding, funding, funding. 
we actually need to start thinking outside of the box and saying, how can we go to our federal government? How do we go to our provincial government and ask for solutions that require cooperation between different ministries so that we are able to achieve more for less? Yeah. You know, if we're doing a project between one community and the other, don't bypass one of the reserves you know, let's bring in the, the different ministries. Let's bring in the, the First Nations people. Let's bring in everybody. Let's collaborate because we know that we don't have economies of scale to work in our favor from a, a, a population standpoint. If we have one trench, let's get 18 different, you know, conduits in it or whatever. That's an analogy, but let's not be digging the same trench 10 different times and all be fighting over budget when we could have just focused on a big project that had a utility corridor that just happened to connect with, you know, and that that's what we have to find ways to do within rural. I'm convinced of that. We need to find ways to be more efficient with our asks and we need to be better at identifying what that, like what, where the jurisdictional opportunities or responsibilities are and then coordinate as the three orders to ensure that we get stuff done for our people. Because at the end of the day, there's just the one taxpayer. We're probably about 40 minutes into this. I don't mind. <laughs> I, I know, but I want to turn to my last subject here because uh, I know you're a busy man and I want to make sure that you get back to doing what you need to do outside of being a counselor. And I want to talk about tourism. I like okay. tourism. And as someone who's literally in your community right now, yeah. I'm going to be looking for tourist things to do while I start heading back towards uh, Calgary. Awesome. So what are some hidden gems in Cypress County that people, tourists, need to see if they come visit? Well, unlike fishermen, which never like to tell about their favorite little fishing holes. <laughs> right? um, no, we have Cypress County. You know, we, We're the home of Cy Cypress Hills, Alberta side. So we have the Elkwater Provincial Park is... Uh, only 25 minutes from my house here right now. That's beautiful. You know, Alberta. We'll be posting a photo of it on social media when this comes out, just FYI. That's right. It's, <laughs> a, it's amazing. Um, but, you know, it's we got bald pra prairies all over, and then we got this little area of the hills that are just covered in trees, and you feel like you're in the foothills, and it's, it's amazing. Um, lakes, uh, we've got uh, a lot of recreational reservoirs as well. But, you know, throughout Cypress County, you've got uh, Red Rock Coulee, You've got the Etsicum has their their museum out there. There's there's a lot of good things around here. Medicine Hat's got some wicked little micro brews around. Uh, IXL, um, the uh, uh, the pottery. Um, I'm blank, drawing a blank at the moment. Um, it's that good. He just doesn't want to talk well, about it. Well, and now I feel terrible. I know IXL is the brick. It's the where they made all the pottery back in like the early 1900s. And oh. You, what you should do is bail me out by posting a picture of this. No, totally. Yeah. That'll, that'll, be, well. that'll, that'll be one. Uh, yeah. And then, and then uh, you, yeah, then you'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, no, it's um, Medelta. That's it. Medelta pottery. That's a good one. Actually, okay. it's, uh, it's a bit of a museum and a. I'm uh, always up for a good museum. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Um, and then a lot of parks like Medicine Hat, you know, city right on the river. They've got trails connecting all three municipalities right now. You can uh, get around. Echodale Park is a great place to go play. And they've got some good golf courses. I don't know if you like golfing, but Desert Bloom is a golf course within the county. That's speaking kind of my a, love language, man. Oh man, it's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, lots of creeks, long course, really good terrain. Nine, eighteen. Eighteen. Oh. It was kind of a PGA style course. It's it's very nice. Bring, bring extra balls because it is it, it swallows them up if it's off the rough. <laughs> Not saying like I have some experience in that one, but yeah. I want to end with the million dollar question. Okay. In your opinion, what makes Cypress County such a unique place to live, to work, and to play? Good people. We have, we have amazing people. We have amazing opportunity. We live in one of the most underappreciated and potentially underseen. I'm not saying we're invisible or we're forgotten. That's not the case. But we are a little hidden gem down here. And uh, it's affordable. Um, you know, housing is, is reasonable. But it is just the, the pace of life that we have down here and the potential that we have is unbelievable. Like really, the sky is the limit for, for Cypress County. I think that... Uh, as we find some wins with the water security and, and going forward with some of those issues, um, the food corridor, the twinning of Highway 3 uh, coming down here, it's been a really, uh, I think it's a positive thing already having Premier Smith in Medicine Hat Brooks. 
um, with Justin Wright now. This is Justin Wright's MLA, Justin right? Wright is my area, yeah, but uh, Premier Smith is uh, from basically from the river north up the brook, so um, we share the two, the two of them within Cypress County. And uh, it, it's a positive thing for, for our region to have, have the Premier down here and, and her seeing exactly what the, the heartbeat of the community is, both rural and urban. And, uh, and I think that we're, we're moving in the direction right now of probably having one of the best relationships regionally um, between the town, the city, and, and the county. We're, we're not there yet. We're, we're, we're climbing those, that, that ladder, those steps. But I do believe that we have a lot of the pieces uh, of the puzzle in line, and uh, our region is going to see some wonderful things moving forward. I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Robin, for A, inviting me into your house, but also for doing this interview and being our 600th guest. It's greatly appreciated. Well, I hope I hope that I did it justice, and I'm grateful that you came, and uh, hopefully we can uh, do this again sometime. We certainly will. So with that, I want to remind everyone, uh, we will be off until September 4th. We do have some episodes that are going to be dropping sporadically throughout the month of August and uh, the later part of July. But we'll be off until September 4th with brand new episodes. Until then, remember, put down your phone, go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be better people. Until next time, just remember, just keep talking.